Time for your daily reminder that uh, the cost of living in America and most other Western nations is artificially inflated by a uh, pernicious conspiracy between corporations and the government. Yes, in any society there will be poor people. Poverty is always relative. Uh, even in the richest of societies, where the where you know people who are supposedly in poverty are richer than a lot of people on the planet, like say American society, people uh, still have very real and very justifiable grievances against their elites. In a country as rich as the United States, as prosperous as the United States. We still have a lot of strife and a lot of people who barely make ends meet because as wealthy as we are in aggregate, it costs an exorbitant amount of money and resources in order to sustain yourself in this society. There is a very, very high uh, floor. There's a very, very high bar which must be cleared for you to meet the bare minimum. Um, to be at the bottom rung of American society. There is a huge gap between someone at the bottom who's homeless and someone who is just barely able to uh, earn enough to pay their rent. And no, today is not even another rant about the housing market, even though to me that is still the greatest evil of our society, the artificially high housing market. The housing market is a part of this. But this is much bigger than the housing market. It extends to everything. Yes, I pointed out how I have found advertisements for new homes uh, in my area where I live here from the 1950s, uh, which prove even on back at, you know with 1950s interest rates uh, and a mortgage or whatever, you could afford to uh, to buy a brand new house on a m making minimum wage. But it's not just housing. Housing is a, I mean, I don't want to call it a microcosm because it is, you know, the most, one of the most basic needs, shelters, you know, are the most basic needs in any society. But it applies. The same things that I've said about housing apply across the board, particularly when it comes to energy and transportation. And so that brings us to the oil industry, big oil, and the car industry. The auto industry, the big three, and it's much bigger than the big three, uh, and their longtime symbiotic relationship with the federal government. It's a tale as old as time. It goes back at least to the uh, the railroads and the uh, um, what was it called the the Federal Trade Commission, the first federal regulatory body created after the Civil War, and. The basic idea of the Federal Trade Commission was to reduce competition so that railroads could raise prices. Because as we all know, market competition is what leads to lower prices because people have to cut their prices in order to compete uh, with other businesses uh, for customers. But the less competition there is, the more you can raise your price. And so if, if you talk to an older person, who was alive, and especially someone who had who could drive back in the 30s, 40s, or 50s, it's likely that they remember a lot more car companies being around uh, than you know the big three that we know today. And I don't want to get too deeply into that story. I think that a lot of people uh, are familiar uh, with that fact that you used to have all these other companies like uh, Hudson, uh, which became you know American Motors and Studebaker. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's the famous story of the Tucker 48. I think in popular culture, the Tucker is probably uh, the, uh, the most well-known case of, you know, the big, uh, the big three or just, you know, the auto, the, the auto giants in general it wasn't necessarily just the big three back then, I don't think, uh, in, in 1948, you know, who conspired to shut down competition. But it wasn't just Tucker. It was the whole auto industry. They wanted to concentrate it, cartelize it, and ultimately raise prices on consumers and the result was that we kept getting crappier and crappier cars that are more difficult to service and by by 2022 they're impossible to service on your own 
and they're pretty much just disposable, consumable goods that you throw away after a few years. Cars are becoming increasingly more consumable uh, as the years go on. You know, if you look back to cars from the 1950s, like they have down in Cuba, because back then they were, you know, they were of course embargoed by the United States, and so everyone is still driving around in their 57 Chevys and and whatnot. Those cars back then, if you keep them, if you service them regularly and replace things when parts break, they will last forever. They found out that when they didn't have the opportunity to buy new cars, they actually, you know, didn't really need it. Now, is it ideal to be driving a car that is 60 or 70 years old? No. But back then, it just shows you that those cars were capable uh, of, being, of being kept in service for that long. They were truly durable goods. Now, what can you say of the cars of today? Uh, obviously, you can't say the same. They've become increasingly more complicated, increasing more increasingly more electronic, uh, more ridden with sensors, and uh, much more fragile. I think that's the key word. They're very, very fragile. Not just in terms of construction. I don't just mean that they're delicate and that the you know the body panels are thin and light and often these days made of plastic or aluminum. But I mean, if one of this, you know, you have a very, very complex uh, machine, which has all of these different circuits running to and fro. If any one of those circuits gets fried or a wire gets crossed or you lose a ground somewhere, the whole thing goes down. And it's so much labor to go through everything to try and figure out what went wrong even. Uh, and if you do find what went wrong, most likely it's a part that's been discontinued because these things are so specific. They make these things for a couple of years and then they, they change the design of the car slightly and then they quit making that part. And so your whole car is bricked pretty much. The culmination of this, of course, is coming in the form uh, of electric vehicles. And I've talked about that extensively. Uh, the example of the, the Chevy Bolt, not to be confused with the Chevy Volt, the Chevy Bolt is a car that was first released five years ago, and uh, Chevrolet is already discontinuing support for it. So if any of you have a Chevy Bolt and uh, the batteries go out, which is inevitable when you have an electric car, uh, batteries do not last forever. They have to be, they, have to, they end up in a landfill. I hate to break it to you. You have these rare earth minerals that go into these, uh, uh, into these electric cars. They're very hard. There's very few of them on the planet. There's only a few places on Earth where you can find them. And once we dig them up out of the ground and process them into a, uh, a lithium battery, that lithium battery has a lifespan that is pretty much fixed. When, you know, it's only going to last so long. When those batteries are done, you have to rip them out of the car, replace them with new ones, and the old batteries, you know, end up in the Earth, polluting the water, um, giving some poor child cancer 30 years from now. Sorry, I don't make the rules. That's just the way these things end up. You know, uh, for, for years, w Americans who were told, oh, you, you know, reuse, uh, 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 reduce, reuse, and recycle. Make sure you separate your recyclables. They found out, actually, uh, a lot of those recyclables just end up in the same landfill as their trash. Recycling is another one of those green grifts that I've talked about. Which is unfortunate because, you know, I mean, I do believe in the principles of recycling. I think it's a very good idea. I don't like wasting stuff. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I advocate uh, for, you know, traditional analog, uh, well, really everything. I think durable goods should be durable. I think they should be analog, uh, you know, as analog as possible and made uh, from simple materials like iron and copper uh, that are infinitely recyclable. You've all heard me go through that diatribe plenty of times. But something that you haven't heard me talk about, getting back to the price of oil, which I do think I brought up earlier and then uh, never went back to. When you look at the price of oil today, the price of oil is uh, $115.19 uh, $115 West, uh, WTI, West Texas Intermediate. Uh, that is the price of crude oil, uh, which uh, I had to look up. I wasn't sure if, this, if these were 55 gallon drums uh, a barrel of oil. It's actually apparently 42 gallons, which I wouldn't have guessed. So slightly less than 55 gallons. So one barrel. So that's 115 dollars and 19 cents for 42 gallons of crude oil, and that comes to two dollars and 74 cents thereabouts. 74, 75. Let's say 275. Which some of you might notice that is significantly cheaper 
than the price of gas that we see at the pump. Part of that is the retail markup because, you know, of course, these this oil has to be brought to market and there are these gas stations that exist. They have they have to pay taxes and they have operating costs and you know, they are the ones who are making the fuel available to you. So you would imagine, OK, they're going to take somewhat of a cut. There's going to be some markup there uh, for the retailer. But 274, I mean, that's like half what people are paying for gas and diesel in a lot of parts of the country. And in fact, you know, if you're in California, it's way less than half. So where is all that going? Uh, it, it goes into something called the refiner's premium. And the refiner's premium is how much, uh, the, what the value of refined petroleum products is uh, versus crude oil. Because we don't burn in our cars, of course not. We don't burn crude oil. That would be much too simple and much too inexpensive. No, we burn gasoline and diesel which are two byproducts uh, of the refining process. Now, petroleum is also refined and made into a whole lot of other things. But the fact of the matter is, if we could run our vehicles on crude oil, it'd be a lot cheaper than running them on gasoline and diesel. So why don't we do that? I mean, is it just impossible? Is crude oil not a suitable fuel? Well, no, that's, that's not true. In fact, diesel engines were designed originally by Rudolf Diesel to run on basically crude oil. And until, you know, the last 25, maybe 30 years ago, pretty much every diesel engine built could run on crude oil to, you know, decently well to a certain extent. Uh, of course, crude oil is not a monolith. It, it varies quite a bit. But diesel engines didn't used to be very picky. You see, they were analog. They were mechanical. They didn't have a bunch of electronic sensors, you know, uh, just like everything back then. And so, you know, we have the technology. If we wanted to reduce the price of fuel astronomically for the people in this country and make it a lot cheaper for them to drive around, we could just produce vehicles that run on crude oil. Now, of course, the Greens would hate it because, you know, it'd, it'd be a little smokier. These old-timey, you know, low-pressure diesel engines, uh, they were not what the Greens would call clean. But then again, the Greens hate fire in general. These people are afraid of fire. Uh, they are anti-civilization. I mean, fire is what, is what set... Man-mastering fire is what set him apart from the beasts. That is what built human civilization. And these people want to extinguish all fires. No joke. I mean, we see this out in California, how they refuse to have controlled burns. Every time that any fire breaks out in the wild, they want to put it out because they think fire is bad. And that fire is, oh my gosh, it's so terrible for the environment. We can't let fires burn. Look at all the smoke. When in reality, fire is a natural part of this planet. Fires have raged for as long as as this planet has existed. Fire is a great thing. We can't live without fire. And the internal combustion engine is the most efficient uh, way to harness fire to achieve man's own goals. And it's brilliant if you think about it. You know, for all of human history, we've had to use fire out in the open. It's, we've literally built fires and then tried to capture the heat, you know, by you know, heating water to create steam, to run a steam engine, uh, or, um, you know, to heat our food directly by building a fire underneath a pot, or to light torches so that we could see at night. But the internal combustion engine allowed us to contain fire within uh, this cast iron engine block and it allowed us to have all the benefits of fire to generate uh, power uh, to uh, do to accomplish work uh, to to create light oh and all we end up with is a, a relatively small amount of smoke when you compare it to a normal fire that we would have built on the ground but over time the greens became obsessed with that they hated smoke they wanted 
uh, to not see the smoke, then they wanted to not smell the smoke, and these days they want the smoke to be gone entirely. Uh, they don't want there to be any fire. You can't start a fire in the woods when you go camping. Uh, you can't have controlled burns to help manage the wildlife and the vegetation, even though that's what would happen in nature, absent man's meddling. And you certainly can't have any fires uh, to further the goals of man. That's evil in and of itself. And so because of that, um, and also because of the, you know, the willingness of, of the auto industry to reduce competition, increase complexity so that they could raise prices, the simple solution of just burning crude oil, uh, even though we could build engines that run on that, they get much better fuel mileage uh, than you know, the engines that are currently powering our cars. Think about it. We could get better fuel mileage and the fuel would cost, you know, it, roughly half as much. It would be more efficient in every way possible, but it would not be what the greens call green. It would not produce toxic waste that would end up in landfills. It would not consume extremely rare earth minerals, uh, which likely would be used up uh, in a number of decades if we tried to, le you know, to, if we tried to uh, bring on the mass adoption of uh, electric vehicles. And these vehicles that run on crude oil, they would be much less expensive. And frankly, we can't have transportation be that democratized. We need to move it in the opposite direction. We need $150,000 Teslas that nobody can afford. And the, these cars will only get more expensive as adoption of them increases because then these, uh, these resources, these extremely scarce resources that are needed to make the batteries will only go up in value because they are so scarce on this planet. It's not like oil where they're everywhere and it's just waiting to be discovered. And so the price of electric cars will go up. Unlike other technology, normally when more people adopt a new form of technology, the price goes down. With electric cars, it will be unique in that the price will continue to go up. It will necessarily skyrocket. And the end result is that very few people will be able to afford these electric cars, uh, which, you know, call me, call me a cynic, but I think that's largely by design. I don't think it's a coincidence that the refiner's premium is uh, uh, is so exorbitant right now. Uh, at the same time, when we have this push for the Great Green Grift, you can call it a conspiracy theory all you want. But when all of the elites gather, you know, in the West and say we want to do away with fire, with the internal combustion engine, but really fire in all sense, they don't like fire in any context, whether it's in a car or not. They're trying to take away the, the one thing that really separated human beings from beasts. And they're very clear in saying that they want us to own nothing, they want us to be happy, they want us to live in pods and eat bug meat. That's why they're testing it on school children and whales. And so I don't consider myself to be a conspiracy theorist because I'm not theorizing about anything. I'm looking at what they're doing. This is what they're setting up. If they really cared about fuel prices, if they cared about these people hurting with the cost of living, putting aside the housing stuff, I've talked about in the past, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of housing and how they don't care about that. But just with people with the, with the price of transportation, the price of shipping goods, think about that. If instead of pushing this great green grip, or if they really cared about the price of fuel and the cost of transportation, what they would be pushing are opposed piston diesel engines that will run on crude oil. That would be it. That's the cheapest thing you can do. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, opposed piston uh, engines, you have two, uh, two pistons that are being pushed by the same, uh, by the same blast, by the same explosion, by the same internal combustion. So you basically, I don't want to get make this too technical, and I'm not an engineer, but the, I, I, I mean, I've seen plenty of testing with them. They seem to get not quite double the fuel mileage, but you're you're get, taking much better advantage of each individual explosion because you're uh, it's impinging upon two pistons rather than one. 
and uh, because the way that these engines are designed, uh, they, they and the nature of trying to combust crude oil, you know, it's going to be a diesel type of engine. Uh, crude oil is not really going to combust well with a spark plug. But this is not a technical video. I'm not trying to make the case uh, for, you know, why we should, you know, go in this direction. All I'm saying is that this is the direction that you would see people trying to move, that you would see investment if there was really any concern about the cost of living. Because if you could produce, and these would be very simple engines. I mean, you could make them, uh, you know, simple air-cooled motors that don't weigh very much, little, well, four-piston, two-cylinders technically, but the equivalent of what we call a four-cylinder. You could put, you could probably stuff them into just about every car that's currently produced, and you could start selling crude oil at gas stations, just like they started selling that E85 crap ethanol fuel. And if we started putting these sorts of engines uh, in, uh, you know, in heavy trucks, which haul all of our goods here domestically. And I, I mean, they pretty much are already in all the ships, I think. I think this is, uh, when you have, uh, you know, these freighters, they, they go across the ocean, they tend to run on crude oil. And the reason for that is that it's cheap and efficient. You know, why would you make a freighter run on refined diesel or gasoline? It's just, you know, it's absurd because when you're talking about in, you know, international waters and things, you don't have to deal with all of these stupid regulations, at least not yet. They're trying to change that. But just so you know, I mean, a, a, a semi-truck these days, not only does it have to run on this refined diesel, ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel, uh, it's uh, which is where I live, approaching $6 a gallon. And it's much more expensive even than 93-octane gasoline. These engines are bogged down with all of these uh, EPA-imposed emissions controls, which make the engines uh, essentially choke they're much less efficient, they run much hotter, they don't last as long, they need much more repairs, which of course the, uh, the automakers love. They love that they have to uh, service these engines and, and these vehicles much more frequently. Uh, they, and they also require an additional fluid to be purchased called diesel exhaust fluid, uh, which, is, uh, which is made from uh, natural gas. And this is also all about trying to reduce the, you know, supposed evil pollutants coming out of the tailpipe. And the end result is that these trucks get like five miles per gallon. And they're running on fuel that is very, very expensive. So you have low fuel mileage and high fuel costs, you know, a high unit price for the fuel. Uh, with a, you know, a, I don't, and again, I don't mean to sound like a shill here. And I'm not shilling for anybody. Nobody's making this, what I'm talking about. I'm just saying that. Just from a common sense perspective, you make an opposed piston engine that runs on crude oil. Very doable. <laughs> it's been done. The, the Russians are and the Ukrainians are currently using them in their tanks. Just so you know, it's, this is very old technology. This is not new. And voila, you've largely solved the energy crisis here in the U.S. And you say, oh, well, you know, oil shocks are always temporary. Well, in the 1970s, it lasted for a long time. And here's the thing. Every once in a while, we have these oil shocks. And even if it goes away or whatever, when the price of oil goes down and energy becomes cheaper again, it'll just be that much cheaper if we make vehicles that run on a less expensive fuel that doesn't have to be as heavily, re that doesn't have to be refined. And uh, two... Uh, is, you know, last longer, cheaper to maintain, and get better fuel mileage. I mean, it just helps all around. It'll make things more efficient. People don't care about efficiency. There's no concern about that. They care about making money. They care about themselves. And when selfish people can conspire to set the rules of the game, to weed out competition, this is what we end up with. You know, it's... That's why I get so frustrated, you know, and I, I, I've gotten over the years to try and forgive leftists because I know when they say, when they talk about capitalism, they mean something very different for me. But when I, when I talk about things like this, you know, this is examples of how we don't live in a capitalist society. When you look at a modern car and how it's put together, or modern anything for that, a modern refrigerator, look at how this crap is put together and you tell me that a you know, free market competition produced that. You tell me, really, that's the best that our 
uh, that the human race has to offer, that we couldn't design something better, that nobody could come up with a better product uh, that would outcompete the garbage that we produce these days. It's not true. We certainly could produce it. In fact, you know, things today are, are so bad that we produce better crap in the past. That's not the way it should work. The way that progress is supposed to work is that you make better things over time, not worse. The reason why crap is getting worse is because of collusion, because of conspiracy between the private and the public sector, as we euphemistically call them. You think it's a coincidence that EPA regulations uh, just so happen to make all of our vehicles run like garbage? You think it's a coincidence that EPA regulations make your car get worse fuel mileage than it otherwise would? You think it's a coincidence that the uh, uh, that our entire transportation industry runs on these uh, heavily refined fuels? And even the new cars that don't run on these heavily refined fuels, gasoline and ultra low sulfur diesel, uh, these new vehicles are even more complex require you know even more processing require even more maintenance and you know tie you down even more to the manufacturer the way that wall street has been going is they've been trying to train businesses we don't want you to produce products for your for your customers to buy and to use we don't want you to produce durable goods we want you to turn your customers into cash cows we want you to milk those customers for every dime that they've got for their entire life. They want every business to be a service business. They want to see that you're raking in cash uh, you know, from your, from your recurring customers every month. They want you to sell extended warranties. They want you to be selling parts constantly. Uh, they want you uh, to own your customer. They want your customers, on the other hand, to own nothing. In the new economy, and I shouldn't even say the new economy because this is where, you know, big business has always wanted to take us. But it's just they've never had this much power. And, you know, the World Economic Forum, you know, they haven't been able to uh, – their plans are just now starting to come to a head. Hopefully they'll fail. But I don't think that enough people really understand. Even though people know the name World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and things like that, that's good. But I don't think they fully fathom like the way that this, because this is a very, once I, once I, I didn't know the name World Economic Forum at first, but then once I realized what they were doing, I, 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 I was able to put it in the context of economic history and I realized, oh, this is the same crap that, you know, big business has always been doing. This is nothing new here. They're just trying to take advantage of consumers and use the state uh, to make consumers subservient to business. So I would encourage you to look into Look into just about everything you buy, at least things that bother you. Whenever you feel pain in your wallet for something that you're having to pay for, look into the industry. Look into how it's regulated. Look into the laws governing that industry and the, uh, you know, the, the regulatory agencies and who the big business players are in that industry. And most often you will find that there's a very similar story that there are a few folks who stand to gain a lot of money from making you suffer and by making you pay much more than you should. And they use the long arm of the law in order to force you to do that. And they ultimately, the uh, each individual industry may not drive you into bankruptcy, but collectively, all of them trying to bilk every, each and every consumer as much as they can it all adds up. And the total sum of it is that consumers, meaning ordinary people, the people who are not uh, well connected with the state, you know, the vast 99.999% of us who have no affiliation and who don't own politicians and who don't control these regulatory agencies, we are milked and driven into poverty relative poverty. We're much poorer than we otherwise would be. So with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.